أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ثم أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فلولا إذ جاءهم بأسنا تضرعوا ولكن قست قلوبهم وزين لهم الشيطان ما كانوا يعملون صدق الله العلي العظيم صل على محمد وآل محمد الحمد لله we have reached ayah number 43 of surah al-an'am and in order for us to understand ayah number 43 we have to go back for a moment and look at ayah number 42 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala essentially shares with us one of, the, one of the reasons why He puts human beings through misfortune and hardship. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمَمٍ مِّنْ قَبْلِكَ We have sent prophets to the nations and communities before you. فَأَخَذْنَاهُمْ بِالْبَأْسَاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ We seized them with misfortune and hardship for what purpose so that perhaps they may humble themselves and we mentioned in our last session that there's a hadith from rasulullah where he says where if it were not for three things no human being the son of adam would not lower his head in humility and they are sickness poverty and death so you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one of the reasons why he puts us through misfortune and hardship is because going through these challenges and these difficulties humbles the human being so in verse 42 Allah says that he seizes communities with misfortune and hardship and calamity so that they may humble themselves this is the proper reaction to calamity that it should remind you of your mortality. It should make you mindful of your vulnerability, of your insignificance, of your utter dependence upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what happens when you have the wrong response to misfortune and hardship, you find that when people fail to respond to such tests of adversity with humility, what happens? The Quran here in this ayah, ayah number 43, Allah says, فَلَوْلَا إِذْ جَاءَهُمْ بَأْسُنَا تَضَرَّعُوا That when they don't respond accordingly, if they don't have the correct reaction to these hardships, what happens? Their hearts become hardened. وَلَكِنْ قَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ There are many verses in the Qur'an that speak about this phenomenon of the heart becoming hardened. We have many ahadith where the imams, where the prophets, they speak and they essentially diagnose this dangerous spiritual disease. For example, there's a hadith from Nabi Isa alayhi salam. We actually have many ahadith from Prophet Jesus alayhi salam where he speaks about this concept of a heart that has become hardened. The hadith in, the, in this hadith, you find that Isa alayhi salam actually strikes a very beautiful analogy between a hardened heart and a wild animal, a wild, undomesticated animal. He says, the hadith says, He says that. If you have an animal and you never ride it, you never tame it, you don't use it, 
it will become very difficult for you to mount it because you haven't taken the proper steps to domesticate this animal. So, you, so Isa alayhi salam, he says, the animal that is that you never ride on and you never train and you never tame or discipline, it becomes difficult for you to mount it and even its nature starts to become very wild. You can't tame it anymore. وَكَذَلِكَ الْقُلُوبِ Nabi Isa alayhi salam, he says, hearts are very similar. إِذَا لَمْ تُرَقَّقْ بِذِكْرِ الْمَوْتِ وَيَتْبَعُهَا دُؤُوبُ الْعِبَادَةِ تَقْسُ وَتَغْلُوبُ Isa alayhi salam, he says, hearts are similar. There is a certain way to tame an animal, and there is a certain way to tame the human heart. Nabi Isa alayhi salam, he says, one of the ways that you soften the heart, and you tame the heart, and you discipline the heart, is to be mindful of death. To remember and be mindful of your mortality. It's not enough that you just think about death. It's that you engage in ibadah. You obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You force yourself to do wajibat. Yeah, it's not comfortable to wake up for Salat al-Fajr. But you have to tame the soul. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he says, do not force yourself to do mustahabbat. Because if you do your heart will develop an aversion to worship. But when it comes to the wajibat and the muharramat, you have to be very firm, very strict. You have to tame the soul. So if you're not mindful of death and you don't engage in ibadah, the heart will become hard and very harsh. So in the same way that an animal, if it's left to its own, if it's not disciplined and tamed, it runs wild. You can't control it anymore. Similarly, the heart also has to be tamed through remembrance of death, through acts of worship. Otherwise, the heart will become hardened and animalistic in nature. And then, at the end of the ayah, those who develop hearts that are hardened, Allah says, وَزَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ You also become very susceptible to the to the, to the machinations of Satan, to his temptations. You find that Allah says, Shaytan does tazeen. He makes sin seem very fair in your eyes. He makes it attractive to you. And it's interesting that Shaytan has to do tazeen. You know, tazeen is used when you're trying to make something attractive that is unattractive. You don't do tazeen of something that's already beautiful. So you find that in this ayah, there's, there's an implicit message that sin is inherently ugly. Therefore, shaitan has to beautify it in your eyes. Good deeds are naturally attractive. They're naturally good. That's why they're very compatible with the fitrah. That's why when you do a good deed, you feel good about yourself. You feel happy because you're doing something that's compatible with your fitrah. Whereas with sin, the only way that shaitan can draw you and lure you to commit sin is because he makes it look attractive in your eyes. He gives the sin a facelift. He makes it look good. And he has to because sin is inherently re reprehensible. It's repugnant. It's ugly. It's unappealing. So he has to do tazeen. There's a hadith from Amir al-Mu'mineen, salawatullahi alayhi, where he says, and this is mentioned in Nahj al-Balagha in sermon number 64. The Imam, alayhi salam, he says, al-shaytanu muwakkalun bin. Shaytan has made it his agenda that he's going to try to tempt you, that he's going to misguide you. This is his main goal. This is the goal of his existence. It's to misguide you, to make you go astray. So he has taken charge of your affairs. 
Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, Shaytan is trying to make you commit ugly actions. Shaytan never, you know, he, he doesn't come to you and whisper to you saying that I want you to drink alcohol, I want you to do this and that. He tries to package it for you in a way that's easily justifiable in your mind. He makes it attractive. So Amir al muminin says, يُزَيِّنُ لَهُ الْمَعْصِيَ لِيَرْكَبَهَا Shaytan makes sin look attractive, so you commit it. If he doesn't make it look attractive, you would never commit it. You would see it as it is. You would see it as a repugnant act. وَيُمَنِّيهِ التَّوْبَةَ لِيُسَوِّفَهَا Shaytan is very clever. Shaytan doesn't tell you, after you commit a sin, Especially if your fitrah is still intact, you feel guilt, you feel remorse. Shaytan doesn't tell you don't ever do tawbah. Amir al he, he says, Shaytan gives you hope that one day you will do tawbah. And therefore he makes you delay tawbah. So on the one hand, Amir al he says, Shaytan makes sin attractive to you so you commit it. After you commit it and you feel this regret and remorse, he tries to convince you that, you know, you're going to become religious later on in your life. He makes you delay Tawbah. He doesn't tell you not to do it. He gives you this false hope that in the future, you will rectify your state with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will start a new page. He doesn't want you to do Tawbah now. He says, delay it. You know, do it when you get older. You know, do it gradually. And you know, he mentions, this is one of the tactics of shaitan. He gives you this false hope, so you delay Tawbah, you keep on delaying it, and then Malakul Mawt seizes your soul before you have the opportunity to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ayah number 44. فَلَمَّا نَسَوْ مَا ذُكِّرُوا بِهِ فَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ أَبْوَابَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ the verse says, when so when they forgot that which had been remind that which they had been reminded, we opened to them the doors of everything until they rejoiced in that which they were given. We seized them suddenly, and they were then in despair. So Allah here says, so when they forgot that which they had been reminded. What is Allah talking about in this ayah? What did they forget? Some of the commentators of the Quran, they say they forgot that which they had been reminded, meaning that they forgot the lesson they should have learned from misfortune and hardship and that is you have to be humble you have to have humility because only a human being who is humble will sur surrender to the truth the first sin ever committed by any creature of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was because of arrogance why didn't shaitan prostrate to adam it was because of arrogance he felt that he was superior so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is saying that they forgot the lesson that they should have learned when I put them through misfortune and hardship. They should have learned that they are utterly dependent on me. They should have learned that they're fragile creatures, that they're vulnerable, that they need me, that they're not invincible, and therefore they should humble themselves. So in response, when they don't humble themselves, when someone persists in sin, you may think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would immediately punish them. When someone continues to sin and is persistent in their disobedience and defiance, you would think immediately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would strike them down. But in this ayah, Allah shares with us a very unique way that he punishes people Allah says فَلَمَّا نَسَوْ مَا ذُكِّرُوا بِهِ when they forget that which they had been reminded of 
Allah says, فَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ أَبْوَابَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ Allah says what? In response, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not send immediate punishment. Rather, He opens to them all things. He removes their suffering and He grants them ease and prosperity. Now you may think, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remove their suffering and grant them ease and prosperity when they have forgotten what they should have learned, when they continue to defy Him? You see, brothers and sisters, oftentimes we think the person who's suffering and going through hardship, they are experiencing divine wrath. When in reality, we should be most afraid when we are sinning and we are living a prosperous life. There's a hadith from Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, where he says, Ya ibn Adam, the Imam is speaking to all human beings because the Imam السلام, understands this reality. He says, Ya ibn Adam, إذا رأيت ربك سبحانه يتابع عليك نعمه وأنت تعصي فاحذره. The Imam عليه السلام he says, O oh son of Adam, if you find yourself disobeying your Lord and Allah continues to send upon you His bounties and His blessings, that's when you should be very afraid. That's when you need to be very cautious. Because brothers and sisters, you know, sometimes when you go to the doctor, they give you a prescription, they give you certain dietary restrictions maybe. But if the doctor finds that you never follow his instructions, he gives you a prescription, you don't take the medicine. He gives you certain guidelines and you don't follow them. And every time you go to him, he realizes that you never take his advice. What is the doctor going to do? especially if they're not living in the United States, so they're, you know, they're not, they're not going to get sued. They'll tell you, listen, do whatever you want. Do eat whatever you want. Why would the doctor say eat whatever you want to someone who has diabetes? Why? Because if the patient doesn't listen. They've lost hope in the patient. They've lost hope in this patient, uh, you know, following their advice and making an effort to improve their health. Similarly, there are certain people where they have reached a point where they continuously sin, they don't heed divine warning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has tried so many ways to guide them and bring them closer to Him, and they continue, they continue to refuse. Allah says, listen, in this life, the way that you get closer to me is through trial and tribulation. I don't want you to get close to me. You're not interested in coming near me? Do whatever you want. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala essentially leaves them to themselves. He doesn't put them through misfortune and hardship because they don't learn. They don't learn, they don't learn, and Allah leaves them to their own devices. There's a tradition where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, the Holy Prophet, he once visited one of the, his companions. And it's an interesting hadith. Rasulullah goes and he enters his house and the Prophet saw that inside of the house there was a bird nest and there were eggs inside of the bird nest. Rasulullah was looking at this bird nest and one of the eggs fell from the bird's nest. And it fell and it landed perfectly on a nail that was protruding from one of the walls. Imagine, the egg falls perfectly on this and it sits on this nail somehow and it doesn't fall and crack on the floor so rasulullah was puzzled shocked he had never seen something like this so he looks at the his companion the owner of the house his host he looks at him and says what is this usually when an egg falls from the nest and it falls towards the ground it cracks it landed perfectly on this nail and it didn't crack on the floor. This man told Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, I have never experienced any 
misfortune or hardship in my life. I always, in a, I'm always in a state of ease and comfort and prosperity. I don't have any problems in life. Everything gets resolved. I have no issues, no problems, no calamities, no sickness, nothing. No poverty, nothing. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa do you know what he did? He farewelled the man and he immediately left. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was afraid to be around this person. You may think, what a lucky guy. Most of us would say, what's your secret? We want to live, we want to also live in prosperity, live a trouble-free, comfortable, prosperous life. But this is very dangerous, brothers and sisters, because Allah tells us this you were created to endure hardship in this life that's the only way that you grow spiritually that's the only way that you're able to refine your morality that's how you draw closer to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the holy prophet says this is someone who's damned and condemned by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah has left this person to himself so we should never grieve and fall into despair when we go through trials and tribulations this is a sign that Allah has hope in you, that Allah wants you to come closer and closer. And we know that the most beloved creation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Holy Prophet. So if living in a state of prosperity is a sign of being in divine favor, Rasulullah should have lived a prosperous, trouble-free life. But you find who suffered the most? Rasulullah did. As the Holy Prophet says, Ma u, and whose prophets suffer the most in general, and who suffered more than any prophet? Rasulullah. Rasulullah says, Ma u ma Imagine it's it's a very heavy statement. Rasulullah says, No prophet, no prophet. And Rasulullah is a sadiq al amin He's the truthful. He doesn't exaggerate. He says, No prophet has suffered as I have suffered. Read the Qur'an. Look at how much Musa suffered. Look at how much Yusuf suffered. Yusuf was, his brothers tried to kill him. He ended up in prison. He suffered. Dawood, Sulaiman, Nuh. Nuh used to get stoned for preaching. Yet yeah, Rasulullah says, no prophet suffered as I suffered. So you find in the Qur'an, there is a type of, divine interweaving of hardship and ease and this is likened and some ulama they liken this to the actions of a caring father who sometimes is harsh with his children and sometimes he's very gentle in hopes of cultivating their moral character so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he knows when to show us mercy and and ease and comfort and when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to put us through some difficulties. So again, being in a state of prosperity is not necessarily a sign that Allah is pleased with you. In fact, in most cases, it's probably a warning sign that, that you're drifting so far away from the straight path that Allah is on the verge of leaving you to yourself. And this is why in history you find people like Yazid ibn Muawiyah they had this impression that if I'm on the path of batil, why am I still the khalifa? Why do I have all of this wealth? Why am I comfortable? Lady Zainab alayhi salam, she reminded Yazid of an ayah in the Quran. The ayah is from Surah Ali Imran, Surah 3, verse 178. Allah says, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَنَّمَا نُمْلِي لَهُمْ خَيْرٌ لِأَنفُسِهِمْ Do not consider, do not think that those who disbelieve, that we grant them respite, and that's for their benefit. إِنَّمَا نُمْلِي لَهُمْ لِيَزْدَادُوا إِثْمًا وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ مُهِينٌ That we grant them time. We leave them to enjoy, not because we're trying to reward them. We're actually trying to punish them. So they increase in sin, so their punishment is even more humiliating and severe. So you find 
at the end of the ayah, going back to ayah number 44, Allah says, فَلَمَّا نَسَوْ مَا ذُكِّرُوا بِهِ فَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ أَبْوَابُ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ حَتَّى إِذَا فَرِحُوا You know, because Allah showers them with His blessings, even though they're defying Him, they rejoice. They think that life is good. And then what does Allah do? Allah seizes them. أَخَذْنَاهُمْ بَغْتَةً you know, subhanAllah, brothers and sisters, it's very interesting that when you look at tyrants throughout history, when does Allah come down on them with an iron fist? Usually when they reach the pinnacle of their power. If you look at Saddam, if you look at Fir'aun, if you look at all of these tughat, all of these oppressors, Allah lets them build, 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 build. They build their empires. They're at the height of their power. And then Allah seizes them. He takes it all away from them. Because Allah wants them to taste that bitter contrast between you know, being in a state of comfort and He just strips it away from them. So their sense of despair, when Allah sees them suddenly, was heightened. It's a heightened sense of despair because of the contrast with the ease and prosperity they had enjoyed previously. Like Fir'aun. Fir'aun was at the height of his power. And then what? Allah drowns him in the Red Sea. It's a very sharp contrast. You go from being the most powerful man in all of Egypt, and then in a moment, you are the most helpless creature. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala drowns him in the Red Sea and his body, so Allah even preserves his body. And his body is on display in the museum in Cairo, the corpse of Ramses, the mummy of Ramses the, the second. And it's there as an ayah for people of all generations. That this man, Allah says, I he defied me and I continue to give him and give him and give him. He rejoiced, he thought that he was on top of the world and then I pulled the rug from beneath him. This is Allah's sunnah. He gives and gives, and then he seizes these individuals. The ayah ends with mublisun. Mublisun means to be in a state of despair. And even shaitan, his name is iblis. And the name iblis comes from the word despair. Now, it's interesting that when you look at the character of Iblis, he also experienced a very sharp contrast. He goes from being in the company of Malaika. He had a very high spiritual status. So in dunya, Allah speaks to us about people who are very elevated from a worldly standpoint very wealthy and powerful, and Allah sees them suddenly and He brings them down. Similarly, you find that Shaytan, Iblis, occupied a very high spiritual status, at least outwardly. He was in the company of angels, and in a single moment, one slip, and he is demoted. And he's banished from the assembly of angels. Now there's a, there's a hadith from Amir al-Mu'mineen where he speaks and he wants us to take lesson from how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala humiliated Iblis. Amir al-Mu'mineen he says, فَعَتَبِرُوا بِمَا كَانَ مِنْ فِعْلِ Iblis." The Imam السلام, he says, and take lesson from the action of Iblis. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib is speaking to us. إِذْ أَحْبَطَ عَمَلَهُ الطَّوِيلُ وَجُهْدَهُ الْجَهِيدُ Imam says, take lesson from the action, from the story of Iblis. He nullified. All of his actions, all of his worship, his years of worship and ibadah and his efforts, 
in a single moment. Imam Ali, he describes what he means when he speaks about the ibadah of Iblis. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says, Iblis, this Iblis that you say, you say, A'udhu Billah, min ash-shaytan al-rajim, this Iblis that you're speaking about, he worshipped Allah for 6,000 years. So if you want to look at quantity of ibadah, he has more quantity than all of us put together. Imam says he worshipped Allah for 6,000 years. And then the Imam says, لا يدرى أمن سني الدنيا أمن سني الآخرة Imam says we don't know if these years are worldly years or years that are according to the calculations of another world, another realm. In any case, we're talking about worship for a very lengthy period of time, eons. Because, but because of a moment of pure arrogance, all of that ibadah, all of that worship was nullified. Was nullified. So we have to be careful, brothers and sisters. Don't think that, you know, I've, I've been worshipping, I've been praying for 10, 50, 20 years, and I'm immune. You have to always be cautious. It could be a single sin, a single terrible sin that you commit, and you invalidate all of the efforts. Everything goes to, a, to waste. And this is the danger of this arrogance. And this is why in the previous ayat, Allah says, the best, the only way that I can teach you humility and humbleness is that I have to put you, I have to make you suffer and struggle and you have to lose wealth and you have to go through times of sickness because of how dangerous arrogance is. And then in the next ayah, ayah number 45, so the people that committed ghulm, they committed injustice, they committed wrong, they were eliminated. And praise belongs to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. This phrase means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uproots and obliterates and eliminates people who continuously oppress. Brothers and sisters, Zulm is a very, very dangerous crime. You find that Amirul Mu'mineen, again in Nahjul Balagha in letter number 53, he speaks about the danger of oppression, especially oppression to other people, oppressing others. He says, لَيْسَ شَيْءٌ أَدْعَى إِلَىٰ تَغِيرِ نِعْمَةِ اللَّهِ وَتَعْجِيلِ نِقْمَتِهِ مِنْ إِقَامَةٍ عَلَىٰ ظُلْمٍ The Imam alayhi salam, he says, do you want to know a way that you can remove Allah's blessings from your life? If you want to ward off divine blessings and bring down divine wrath the fastest way to strip yourself of Allah's ni'mah and bring down Allah's wrath the fastest way is to be a zalim to oppress other people why the imam says فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ السَّمِيعُ دَعْوَةِ الْمُضْطَهَدِينَ وَهُوَ لِلظَّالِمِينَ بِالْمِرْصَادِ the Imam says, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quickly responds to the dua of someone who is mazloom. You know, many of these tyrants that we see that are toppled, you know, don't think that it's because of the superpower A or superpower B. Believe me, brothers and sisters, many times it was probably the dua of a mazloom person in that community. And Allah has his ways of bringing certain superpowers to overthrow other superpowers. You know, there's the Hadith Qudsi where Allah says, And 
ثُمَّ أَنْتَقِمُ مِنْ Allah says, a zalim, an oppressor, is my sword. I use him to seek vengeance against other oppressors, and then I seek vengeance against him. And subhanAllah, today, you know, if you look at what's happening in, in Qatar, Saudi, one zalim is attacking the other. Allah is just, he's keeping the zalimin distracted among themselves, and then Allah brings down, you know, the zalim who takes down another zalim. So the Imam says this zulm, when people do zulm, Allah says, He uproots them, He eliminates them, He obliterates them. He doesn't even leave a remnant of them. And then the ayah ends with, Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So this terrible warning is followed by a formula of praise to Allah. Now you may say, why is Allah speaking about the way that He uproots and eliminates Valimin? And then the ayah ends with Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. This is in recognition of Allah's many merciful efforts to bring these people to guidance before their destruction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises himself after he speaks about the destruction of these oppressors. Not because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes joy in destroying, but because Allah doesn't punish. He doesn't destroy until he has exhausted all efforts to guide them. If you take, for example, Fir'aun, you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because Fir'aun committed one sin, Allah drowned him in the Red Sea. Allah sent two prophets to him. He sent Musa and Harun, and he showed them all of these ayat, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished him. Allah is not itching to punish. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to guide all of these nations that he has destroyed in the past. Allah has sent them prophets, and he has sent them signs, and he had, he had given them warnings. But because they refuse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished them. And there is a, a principle that's mentioned in the Quran. If you go to Surah Al Isra, Surah number 17, ayah number 15, Allah says, Wama kunna mu'adhabina hatta, Wama kunna mu'adhabina hatta nab'atha rasula. Allah says, We do not punish until we send messengers. Until we send guides, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to punish people who just who didn't know the truth, who were misguided because they had no access to truth, because they had no one to teach them, no one to educate them. Allah says, I don't punish unless the message was sent and it was sent purely to them, meaning that it wasn't adulterated, it wasn't distorted, and they understood it. And even when they reject, I give them time to repent. Only then, only after they refuse to repent and they persist in their defiance, that's when I punish them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 46, قُلْ أَرَأَيْتُمْ إِنْ مَنْ إِلَاهٌ غَيْرُ اللَّهِ يَأْتِيكُمْ بِهِ أَنْظُرْ كَيْفَ نُصَرِّفُ الْآيَاتِ ثُمَّ يَصْدِفُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here wants us to consider something. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives. But He also has the ability to take away. He's the bestower of bounties and blessings. And he is the one who can remove those blessings and those bounties. So here Allah is asking us, if Allah takes, if he seizes our hearing, the blessing of hearing. You know, brothers and sisters, our ability to hear and our ability to see, believe me, brothers and sisters, these are two blessings that we really take for granted. Every day we hear people speak, we hear the birds chirp, we're able to listen to each other. How many of us 
have sincerely thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the blessing of hearing. You know, when you have an ear infection, how much do you suffer? How miserable is your day? How painful it, it is for us? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if I take away your hearing and your sight, imagine you couldn't see. Imagine tomorrow you wake up and you're blind. God forbid. How many of us have properly thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the blessing of sight? Most of the time we're making dua for what we don't have. Before we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, give me this and give me that, we need to praise Him, we need to thank Him for these gifts. Believe me, if all of the scientists around the world got together with all of their technology, if all human beings came together, to design an ear that is more efficient than the ear that Allah gave us, we wouldn't be able to do it. If all human beings came together to try to design an eye, forget about the eye, one cell, one living cell, we can't do it. We can only clone, we can only copy what Allah created. Allah says, if I take away your hearing and your sight, if I take away these two, material sensory blessings and what if Allah says what if I seal your heart what if I take your ability to appreciate spiritual truth I make you physically and spiritually blind who is there a Lord is there a God other than Allah that can restore these blessings? Is there someone other than Allah that can give you a functioning ear? Is there other than Allah that can create an eye that is as sophisticated as, as these two eyes that He gave us? Allah says, look at the way that I diversify my signs. Allah says, I guide you, I show you so many different signs. Allah in the Quran, He says, Sanurihim ayatina fil afaq wa fi anfusihim hatta yatabayyana lahum annahu al haq. Allah says, What more do you want? I have filled the universe with signs, with indicators of my greatness, with Everywhere you look, there is my divine signature. And every living being, every inanimate object celebrates my praise, is a testament to my glory and my greatness. And I have put signs even within yourself. There are signs that are external to you and there are internal signs. Allah sends prophets, messengers. He sends infallibles. He has given us intellect. He has given us signs in creation, signs within ourselves. All of these reminders, and we still, Allah says, Thumma yasdifun, and they continue to turn away. They refuse, rebellious. And then Allah, in ayah number 47, He says, قُلْ أَرَأَيْتُكُمْ إِنْ أَتَتْكُمْ عَذَابُ اللَّهِ بَغْتَةً أَوْ جَهْرَةً هَلْ يُهْلَكُ إِلَّا الْقَوْمُ الظَّالِمُونَ Allah says, قُلْ أَرَأَيْتُكُمْ What would happen to you if Allah's punishment comes to you suddenly or openly? Now what is the meaning of suddenly and openly here? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sometimes He punishes suddenly. There are many communities that are mentioned in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala overnight he obliterates them like Qawm Lut, like Qawm Nuh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes them suddenly. Aw jahratan. So suddenly or openly means that this divine punishment may befall them either when they are unaware, for example, while, while they're sleeping, or openly in broad daylight, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes them and they were aware of the signs. 
So the rhetorical question, would any be destroyed? At the end of the ayah, the ayah says, Hal yuhlaku illa al-qawm al So the rhetorical question, where Allah says, would any be destroyed except the wrongdoers, seems to indicate that only wrongdoers would suffer destruction in the face of such a divine punishment. But when you look at the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes destroys entire communities. So in the Qur'an, worldly destruction usually comes upon entire nations except for prophets and maybe a few righteous individuals for if you go to I don't, I don't have time to go through all of these ayat but as a note if you look at surat al-a'raf verses 59 to 93 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about how he destroyed these nations these people and he only saved the prophets and their followers again if you look at surat Yunus, Surah number 11, verses uh, 25 to 95. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Aad and Thamud. And again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only saves, He destroys all of them, but He only saves the prophets and their small band of followers. Now, Fakhrul Razi, who is a prominent Sunni commentator of the Quran, he argues that even if there are some mu'mineen that end up dying when divine punishment descends, it still doesn't negate this principle that's mentioned in the end of the ayah where Allah says, where he says, would, would anyone be destroyed except the wrongdoers? You may say, but we, we have many examples where, for example, natural disasters occur and there are decent people who also perish. Fakhr razi he argues that even in cases where worldly punishment comes upon people as a whole, the pious, the righteous, will ultimately receive reward. Whereas the wrongdoers, they lose both dunya and akhirah, and therefore they are the real losers. And then if we go to the next ayah, verse number Verse number 48. Yeah, 48. Allah says, illa mubashirina wa mundirin. Faman amana wa aslaha fala khawfun alayhim wala hum yahzanun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the Quran, He refers to prophets and messengers as mubashirin and mundirin as bearers of glad tidings and warners and you find that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he does this because people respond differently there are individuals who can be incentivized to do good with promise of reward and we even see this with our children you may have a certain child where if you promise to get them a toy they'll behave the promise of reward is sufficient and then you have other children right you have other children where it doesn't matter what you promise them it doesn't work they're not gonna behave so what do you have to do you have to punish them you have to ground them you have to discipline them that's the only way we human beings, adults are the same way. There are some prophets, they're warners. Because there are some individuals, they only understand the language of threat, the language of warning. And there are others that are motivated and incentivized by bishara. And in some cases, you need the blend of both. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here tells us that if you want to be in a state whereby you don't experience any grief, and some ulama, they say, if you want to eliminate khawf and huzn in this life and in akhirah, because most people, most of our stress comes from what? 
fear of what's going to happen in the future, fear of the unknown, or what? Grief over what happened in the past. If you want to summarize stress, stress comes from these two things. Fear of the unknown, which is related to the future, which is khawf. Khawf is related to the present or the future. Whereas huzn is what? It's related to bad things that happened in the past, things that trouble you, things that depress you about the past. If you want to safeguard and protect yourself from khawf and huzn, what's the formula? Allah says, فَمَنْ آمَنَ وَأَصْلَحَ فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ The ones who believe, who have iman, but having iman alone is not enough. They also have good deeds. They do good. They have righteous actions. Meaning they translate this iman into action. You don't have real iman if you don't have any amal salih to show for it. And subhanallah, there are even studies that show those who volunteer, for example, those who give charity, actually live longer lives. They're generally happier people. People that, you know, volunteer their time at a local hospital, at a soup kitchen, for example, they have, they experience higher levels of happiness. They're less depressed than others. So you find that Allah here says, those who believe and do good, they will not fear and they will not grieve. So you find that there is a deeply interconnected reality between Iman and Amal Salih. That these two, if they're done, it is a very powerful repellent of grief and fear. And therefore, when you go to the next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says what? وَالَّذِينَ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا Those who reject, those who don't have iman and amal salih, يَمُسُّهُمُ الْعَذَابُ بِمَا كَانُوا يَفْسُقُونَ يفسقون is from فَاسِقْ فُسُوق So you have a mu'min, right? Someone who's, who has faith and does righteous acts, and then you have fasiq. Someone who doesn't have faith and doesn't have righteous actions. Allah says what? The one who rejects our signs, يَمُسُّهُمُ الْعَذَابِ Punishment will touch them because of their fusuq, because of their sinful lives. Now you may think to yourself, that the punishment touches them. It may sound like the ayah is speaking about something that's very minimal. You know, it's only going to touch you. It's not going to, you know, destroy you. It's just going to touch you. It's going to graze you. You know, it's interesting when you, when you look at the Quran, and inshallah we'll conclude in a few minutes. If, you're, if you don't have faith, and you don't have good deeds, naturally you're drawing yourself to punishment, Jahannam. Bani Israel in the Quran, you know, they, they, they considered themselves the chosen ones. Sha'abullah al Mukhtar, the chosen ones of God, the favorites of Allah. When they used to commit sin, they used to say, and Allah mentions this in the Quran, they, they knew that ultimately they're going to end up in Jannah. And some of us, we have the same attitude. That, you know, I'm a Muslim, eventually I'm going to end up in paradise. I might go to Jahannam for a weekend, right? But eventually I'll end up in paradise. Bani Israel, they used to belittle the punishment of hell. They used to say what? وَقَالُوا لَن تَمَسَّنَ النَّارُ إِلَّا أَيَّامًا مَعْدُودًا They say, if we go to Jahannam, we're only going to go for a few days. Allah mentions this in Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 80. That even the most wicked among them, they say, listen, it's okay, let's enjoy our lives. We're going to go to paradise eventually. Yeah, we might stay for a few days in Jahannam. We have to understand 
what is Jahannam before we say we can handle a few days in Jahannam? You know, if you go to Surah 25, Surah Al Furqan, verses 65 to 66, Allah mentions the dua of real mu'mineen. They say, وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا صْرِفْ عَنَّا عَذَابَ جَهَنَّمْ The Mu'mineen, they say, O oh Allah, avert from us. Keep the punishment of Jahannam far away from us. إِنَّ عَذَابَهَا كَانَ غَرَامًا Because the punishment of hell is a very heavy punishment. إِنَّهَا سَاءَتْ مُسْتَقَرًّا وَمُقَامًا Jahannam is not a place that we want to be in permanently and it's not a place that we want to be in even temporarily. This is the dua of mu'mineen. We, we definitely don't want Jahannam permanently and we also don't want to even be in Jahannam temporarily, not even for a few moments. If you go and we'll conclude here. Actually, before, before I, I bring you to the final ayah that I want to share with you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number in Surah Al-Anbiya if everyone can go to Surah Al-Anbiya ayah number 46 Surah 21 ayah number 46 in this ayah Allah shares with us the experience of the person who's receiving the least punishment in Jahannam so in this ayah Allah is giving us a snapshot a glimpse into what a human being is experiencing who is experiencing the least painful punishment in Jahannam. Allah says, وَلَئِمْ مَسَّتْهُمْ نَفْحَةٌ In Arabic, the word nafha means a cool breeze. Right? A cool breeze. So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to us about someone who has not yet entered Jahannam, but who's getting just a breeze. You know, sometimes when you open the oven, you kind of feel a little bit of the heat. Yes? Nafha means cool breeze. Lafha is a hot, warm wind. Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about the coolest wind in Jahannam. So this is lowest temperature in Jahannam. Someone is entering. They haven't quite entered paradise. They, own, they felt the coolest wind of Jahannam. No fire has touched them. The least warm wind of Jahannam has grazed their skin. What's their reaction? Allah mentions it. Wail is the worst part of Jahannam. In this ayah, this person is not even in yet. They felt the breeze of Jahannam and they think they're in the worst part of Jahannam. Allahu Akbar, imagine that. Ya waylana, inna kunna zalimeen. The coolest breeze of Jahannam grazes the skin of this human being. And they cry out, I'm in the worst part of Jahannam. You're not even in yet. They say we are in the worst part of Jahannam. Therefore, when you go back to ayah number 49 of Surah Al-An'am, وَالَّذِينَ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا يَمُسُّهُمُ الْعَذَابِ Here the actual punishment is touching them, not the fight, not the wind, not the cool breeze. يَمُسُّهُمُ الْعَذَابِ The punishment touches them. Why? This is not arbitrary because this is the reality of their fusuq. It's the reality of their sin that they are now encountering. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to protect us 
from the punishment of Jahannam and we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to shower us with his mercy and his forgiveness wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin so the question is salam shaykh question number one you mentioned it scares me when I see question number one how many questions are there <laughs> Question number one, you mentioned that one of the ways shaitan uses, uses, one of the ways shaitan uses to keep us away from repenting is to whisper that you can do it later. You can do it gradually. These are obviously very typical tools shaitan is using for young people. What is it recommended as the best weapon against such whispering? The best thing is to remind yourself especially if you're young, that if you go to the cemetery, the cemetery is not just a graveyard of old people who have passed away, right? You go to the cemetery, there are, especially if you go and you read the tombstones, there are people who are young, even younger than you. I remember when I, when I buried my grandfather two years ago, I was walking among the tombstones and you see, yes, there are people that are older than you, and there are people that also are a lot younger than you. So you, you need to constantly remind yourself that death doesn't discriminate. You know, Malakul Maut doesn't only have a list of people who are at the senior citizen home, people who are elderly, people who are in their 70s and 80s. There are many people who are young, that pass away because of illness, because of tragedy. There are many. I remember when I was in when I was in high school, I had a friend who was perfectly healthy, no problems. One night he went to bed and he never woke up. And no one until today, no one knows what happened. He died in his sleep. So the best way to kind of combat these satanic whispers that you could do it later, you could do it later, there are many people who went to bed at night saying, inshallah, tomorrow I'll do tawbah, and they never woke up in the morning. So reminding yourself of your, of your mortality is the best way to not delay uh, repentance. And really, brothers and sisters, I think that every few months if not every year attend a funeral and actually go wash a dead body brothers and sisters it's mustahab to to do ghusl al janaza you know ghusl al mayyit i know it's uncomfortable it's scary but we need these wake up calls believe me when you do it you're going to be you're going to it's going to be a very powerful deterrent from sin itself because you see the look at this person oh, few days ago they were talking and eating and enjoying and now their book of a'mal is closed and they are now entering alam al akhirah the hereafter a world where station number one is the grave imagine you really need to be cautious about a world an alam where the first stage is the grave you know dunya the last stage of dunya is the grave the first stage of akhirah is the grave so that's a world that we really need to take seriously next question is you describe the state where allah leaves you alone to enjoy certain things in your life as your punishment there seems to be a fine line between allah's mercy and that state of ease how can we distinguish between these two states in our lives as i mentioned if you're a pious person if you're doing amal salih and allah is showering with you with his blessings that's a good sign allah says in in if you're grateful to me I will increase your blessings. So if you're thanking Allah and you're seeing that your blessings are being multiplied, there's no reason to fear. But if you're sinning, for example, you're not praying, you're not reading Quran, you're persistently sinning, and also your life is wonderful. No problems, your life is very prosperous, you have no challenges, that's when you need to be very cautious when you are tasting prosperity alongside a life of recklessness and sinning and you know being mischievous that's when you need to be cautious so there's a fine line between and where you're sinning and allah leaves you to yourself 
So you have to ask yourself, am I sinning? Or am I actually doing my best to live a righteous life? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as a result, He's increasing my riz. He's opening up doors of His grace and His mercy. So it, it's really about yourself. If you're sinning consistently and persistently, and Allah is showering you with His blessings, that's when you really need to do toba and really reassess your life. I hope, inshallah, that answers the question. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, so on, on that same note, it still feels like uh, it's still quite a fine line because, like, when we sin quite a bit, there's sins we might have like a, a hard time, like, are we very persistent? And so it feels like you might still be like kind of sinning a lot, but still you may be getting rewarded. Yeah, so when it comes to sinning, you know, there are some sins, you know, that we're in the process of, of eliminating. You know, there are certain habits that take time to, uh, to break. But it's important that even when we're sinning, it's important for us to, uh, to make toba as much as we can. You know, we're, we're, we're talking about people who are sinning and who are not making toba and who are consistently sinning and they're not making any effort to reconnect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you have certain sins that you are committing and you're making a sincere effort, you're repenting, you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his tawfiq to allow you to overcome these bad habits, that's, that's different. Another way, you know, sometimes people ask, you know, I ha sometimes I have, I have trouble, you know, determining whether I'm sinning or not. I don't know if these, if, if these blessings are because Allah is leaving me to myself or they're a reward for my gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The way that you can the way that you can ensure and really determine whether these are blessings that stem from shuk or, or, or these are blessings that stem from Allah just abandoning you and leaving you to your own devices, this is why you have to do muhasaba. This is why Imam al kadhim many Imams of Ahlul Bayt, they say at the end of the day, when you're in bed, either take a pen and paper or at least mentally review your day. Review what you did during the day. Ask yourself, did I, did I commit any sins today? Really think about those sins. Count them. Think, what were the, were there certain triggers? Was there a reason that I committed these sins? How can I avoid them tomorrow? You have to take yourself to account. You have to audit yourself every night. Do at least a mental audit every night. And when you do that, you'll become a lot more attuned to your, uh, to your behavior. Any other questions? I had a quick question. Um, in Ayah 43, uh, Allah mentions that the hearts become hardened, and then a few hours later, He says, "What happens if I seal your heart?" So, what what is the hope for people who whose hearts are hardened or whose hearts are sealed? How do they get out of that state? How do they get out of the state of a uh... sealed or hardened heart? You know, this is uh, when you look at the Quran. The seal on the heart seems to occur when they reach the point of no return. You know, it's, it's almost like, you know, uh, contracting a, a terminal illness. You know, we don't know, we're not pervy to that knowledge. We as human beings, we cannot distinguish between someone who has a heart that is sealed and someone who has a heart that is still you know receptive to the truth that is in allah's knowledge but when allah does seal someone's heart i mean they've essentially reached the point of no return i mean otherwise this the sealing of the heart is meaningless so even even someone like like Fir'aun, his heart was not sealed until the very end, until he reached the point of no return, until he's, 
until Musa came to him, Harun came to him, he heard the ayat, he received the divine invitation, he saw witness the miracles. Then Allah sealed his heart and the punishment descended. So from my, my humble understanding is that once the heart is hardened, and the hardening of the heart has, has levels, you know, but if we're talking about the sealing of the heart, I would say that this is, again, from my, my humble understanding, and if anyone has any evidence to, to negate this, I, I would welcome this. But when the sealing, when the khatm happens, this is essentially a very dangerous state. This is, this is almost like the, the nur of the fitrah has become extinguished. The heart has been condemned and sealed. It's like the, the person who hasn't you know, moved the muscle in years and the, the muscles have deteriorated, the, the, you know, the, the, there's no function anymore. Then this only happens, you know, this, this doesn't happen after someone sins once or twice. This is a lifetime of sinning. This is a lifetime of rejection of truth. This usually happens towards the end of someone's life. You know when they're when they're when they're constantly refusing and turning away. When rebellious becomes their second nature. Thanks. Thank you. Um, question. Yes. You mentioned that um, the oppressors don't receive any punishment till messengers come to them and they've given them the right guidance, the true guidance. So my question is regarding um, the Imam of our time, because like his, his, essentially his job is to guide people. And how is he guiding people being in Ghaiba right now? You know, with the Imam alayhi salam, you know, number one, the Quran is a source of guidance. The ahadith of Ahlul Bayt salam, this is also a sufficient source of guidance for us. But the Imam alayhi salam, how does he guide us during his ghaybah? The Imam alayhi salam, we have you know certain accounts where the Imam alayhi salam has met with certain ulama, with certain individuals. It's definitely not a direct type of guidance. And I mean, I, I would even argue that, you know, in the same way that shaitan in the Quran is known as al waswas al khannas, alladhi yuwaswisu fi sudur al nas. You know, shaitan whispers into the hearts of man. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because He's just, there needs to be something on the other side of the spectrum to balance it out. You have evil whispers, and then you have angelic whispers it could very well be that the imam alayhi salam guides during the ghayba through inspiration this this could also potentially be a way that the imam alayhi salam guides. you know sometimes you get certain thoughts certain ideas and this could be inspired by the imam it's possible but definitely during i mean during the time of ghayba He's not able to take on that active role of guidance. This is why the, the time of occultation is not an ideal circumstance for the Ummah. But with the Quran and with this body of a hadith of the Ahlul Bayt والسلام, and with the pious ulama and the righteous who are living at this time, there is enough of a hujjah against a lot of these uh, individuals. Especially when, when Islam is is increasingly accessible to all people around the world with the advent of of uh of the technological devices the uh that, that we have at our disposal today so there is a hujja against them definitely thank you uh, Sheikh, in, uh the verse 44 uh you said like when they so they forgot that which they had been reminded um, yes could that also be talk saying uh, referring to like them forgetting what their fitrah is talking about and like what they initially knew to be right? Ahsan. The ulama actually, but I, I mentioned, I mean, just for the sake of, of brevity, I only mentioned one view. 
that yeah, some scholars say that you know this this also could refer to uh, in them forgetting, you know, their fitra, the things that they know through their fitra, or the the message that the, the messengers brought to them. So it it could be a, and it could mean all of them. You know, there are different levels of of, uh, of heedlessness. You know, they they forgot their own fitra, the, the things that they recognize through their their natural predisposition. You know, forgetting the uh, the messages that were propagated by the prophets and by the messengers of Allah, and forgetting the the lesson that they should have learned from the misfortune and the hardships that they. Uh, that they experience. So the ulama have mentioned all of these opinions. Thank you. And none of the and none of them are ex, none of them are mutually exclusive. I mean, they could encompass all of these different meanings. All right. Thank you very much, Shia. This was highly educational. As thank always. you so much. May Allah bless you. And uh, inshallah, I pray that you guys are all well. And I see you inshallah next week on Tuesday, same time. Inshallah, yes. Inshallah, may Allah bless you. Salaam alaikum. Wa alaikum as-salam.